So what I did prior to going into the Army was going to school, got my four-year degree, and uh, my, I majored in criminal justice at UW Platteville and also uh, minored in psychology. I went through college on a Navy ROTC scholarship and the Navy paid my books, tuition, $50 a month and let me have some wonderful summer vacations. I was uh, 14 years old uh, in high school yeah. and so basically I wanted to join the Navy so I, I, enjoy, I enlisted before I turned 18. I had been going to uh, the Marine Recruit Depot for uh, since I was in middle school, so I kind of already knew the path I wanted to take. I had a lot of previous uh, family that was involved with the military. I had a good friend of mine that was going to the recruiters that was a year ahead of me, so knowing that's the path I wanted to go on, I figured to get as much information I could ahead of time. When I graduated from high school, I was attending Western Illinois University in Macomb, Illinois, and I was looking to be an eighth grade science teacher. And uh, I enjoy working with youth, and, and but I became a retired service person in lieu of. I visited every branch's office in Grand Rapids, met with all of them for a while. I thought I was definitely going to be a Marine. And then the more I learned about the Navy, I just felt like there was more opportunities that interested me there and originally I thought I wanted to go into special forces so that's originally what I signed up for. I ended up getting into a totally different career path but the Navy just seemed to check all those boxes for me, travel, education, and just the ability to meet new people and, and get around and see things. That was really exciting for me. Well, when I entered college it was required that I join the ROTC as required by the land grants given to Michigan State College. All men had to serve two years of military training. So that's when I started. So I attended UW-Whitewater. And while going to Whitewater, pursuing a degree, uh, my brother-in-law, who was in the Air National Guard, started approaching me and telling me what a good deal this was, that mm -hmm. I should become a pilot. Uh, when I first heard that, the military was probably the farthest thing from my mind. But uh, as time went on, it seemed like a uh, pretty good uh, career path. Uh, the more I looked into it, what it brought, what I could bring to the table, it was, I felt it was a good match. I was doing concrete work. Had that, that's, a, that's about my whole life, uh, concrete work. But it was a lot different back then. There weren't all the machines they got today. You had to use your back. <laughs> uh, I just graduated from high school, Pulaski High School in Milwaukee. And um, after that, uh, I went almost right away into the, into the Army. Well, I was going to college at Penn State University. And uh, this, this was about the... The, uh, my second year at college, I was, I was asked to be drafted into the military. And I, I went to them and asked them if I could be deferred for until I got out of college. And so they did that. They, they let me de decide later what I wanted to do. And I was, I, got, I graduated when I was 17. And a bunch of my friends that I hung out with were always after me, let's go join the service and uh, join the Army or something, you know, because there was nothing in northern Wisconsin to do. So, so in whatever, whatever we were going to do, we had to leave. So finally, they said, well, I, I told him I didn't want to join the Army. And uh, he said, well, and they finally got around, okay, let's join the Air Force. Well, okay. So we got the recruiting sergeant to drive us all over to the Twin Cities, which they did in those days. And then we took all our tests over there, physical and, and mental and all that stuff. And then the um, next morning, we got up and we were going to come back. And I'm the only guy that got in the service. Sure. I actually was a, a junior in high school. And uh, I was uh, just uh, working my way through school, kind of unsure as to what I wanted to do. 
I knew that if I wanted to have any more additional education, that it would probably be a really good idea to have, learn uh, some responsibility. And therefore, I um, kind of moved forward with looking into the service. Uh, I didn't do so well my first semester of college, and I lost my deferment for the draft. And I had choices to make. They were drafting all 18 year olds. And I decided that since I wasn't going to go to college at that time, uh, I had to make a choice of where I wanted to go. So I decided to join the Air Force. I was going to school and working, oh, working full time and uh, hoping to, my plan was to get a teaching degree at UWM. I actually went to college uh, before I enlisted. And while well, there's a story, uh, it's a little sad, but I'll, I'll share it. I wanted to go in, um, I, was, I was denied service at the age of 10. And I still remember receiving the envelope that had the uh, Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Anchor uh, logo on it. And I was all fired up. I'm like, okay, here I go. Uh, I went in, opened up the letter and it started out, son, we'll see you in eight years. So um, I didn't go in right away. And then when I was in my mid-teens, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and um, I didn't want to go in. I didn't want to stress her out any more than what it was. Um, so for me, you know, again, having family who had served, maybe that was an influence. But it seemed like it was more just something I always wanted to do. Yes. And, um, and she had asked me not to go in. And she survived another... Um, Five, five years after after I graduated. And um, once she passed away and I graduated the university, I then enlisted. Oh, the hardest part about leaving for the Army was leaving the family and the close-knit group and the, the friends and uh, entering into an unknown world and yeah. the way the news was broadcasting Vietnam, knowing it was gonna be part of it. It was scary, but uh, we got through it. It was very rigorous. I mean, they, I mean, let's face it, you went through boot camp and you, you had 40, 45, 50 pound packs. Just seeing like, wow, they're serious about this, they're very disciplined and you better show up on time. So that was hard, you know, and also he would just pray for a letter from home that there is an outside world out there. So. I went to uh, recruit deep with San Diego <clears throat> like anything else, it was a shock of what you're really going to expect. You can hear so much about what you're going to expect, but until you're there, you really don't know. So yeah. it was a lot of different people from different backgrounds all combined into one little unit. I still remember the first night I got to boot camp. I was laying in bed and I just thought, what am I doing here? Um, it might have been a few tears. Uh, shed that night, I can't confirm or deny that, but I was, it was, I felt like I grew up overnight. I thought I was home. I mean, when I got slapped in the head and kicked in the shins, I knew I was home. I was at uh, Camp Robinson, Arkansas, and uh, this was only for, for six weeks. And uh, I, I didn't mind it, I figured everybody else was going, I, I, I can go too. And one of the first days, they taught us how to get lined up in a, in a, in a platoon. They don't call them platoons, a squad. But anyway, um, uh, one guy, it was me, <laughs> we were in an Air Force base. This, these airplanes come over. I was looking at them. And the sergeant come over, what do you think you're doing? Well, I'm just looking at this airplanes. <laughs> He's, no, you're not. He said, you're, you're supposed to be at attention here. Oh, okay. So I, that's why I did that one. You got the, your head shaved. It was the time when everybody had long hair. Well, they took care of that pretty quick. And I remember we had to pay for our first haircut. It was 70 cents. You, they're, they're trying to shock you, right? Kind of jar you a little bit mm -hmm. to get everybody, bring you down to a base and build you back up. Yeah. Because what they're trying to do is incorporate in you this training style where there's no individuals. The officer school was down in Knoxville, Tennessee. I attended that in the middle of summer. It started on the 4th of July. I had this belief that they're not really gonna start on the 4th of July, it's a holiday. Well, about four o'clock in the morning, someone was 
banging on my door telling me to fall out with raincoat and shower shoes. <laughs> and I guess they started on the 4th of July. There were so many troops aboard. There have been eight and 12 of the ships. If you had breakfast at eight in the morning, you were dinner at eight at night. If you had breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning, you were dinner at seven o'clock at night. It would cost the time to three days, 17 hours. So, one of these bad seeds was a long time to three meals. I also was in that beautiful ship that many of our engineers carved their initials in the railings. I think my most important contribution was to, to give selfless sacrifice to my country, without a doubt. That is, um, I don't know how much more explanation that needs. I um, was really fortunate to do that. And even through all of the injuries and all of the lasting effects that have, if I were to rewind that, I would, I would re-enlist again today. At the end of the day, if you're asking what my favorite part is, I didn't know it at the time, but I know it now as I look at you know, those military relationships, you don't need to see each other every day. And it's, you know, I think it's kind of unique is you might not see each other for a couple of years. You know, some of those guys at my wedding, I didn't see for three, four years. And the minute they showed up at rehearsal, it was like we you know, saw each other every day. You just pick right back up where you left off. So. By being able to pass on skills to younger soldiers, knowing that if they're called upon to do something, what I taught them is going to be payoff in life-saving skills. I think uh, one of the, the missions that really sticks with me, and it was a simple mission, but it was very important to me, is <clears throat> I flew um, the Secret Service escorting President Reagan when he came to Milwaukee. And uh, we picked up the, the agent at uh, Waukesha Airport, and we flew down to Mitchell Field. And we searched the approach and departure ends of the runway, and. Uh, I was the only aircraft allowed to fly in the airspace because Air Force One was inbound. So um, they came in and Reagan, uh, they went over to the 440th and uh, so they had the, the movable stairs and they put the stairs up next to the, the aircraft and uh, Reagan takes two steps out of Air Force One and he looks up at my helicopter which I had, I was about an 80 foot hover turned sideways for the Secret Service if they needed to engage a target. And Reagan saluted my aircraft and I'm going, oh my, I, I gotta fly this thing. It was probably more towards me than my service. I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I was able to set out and do things that I probably wasn't expecting myself to do, uh, being pushed to that next level. So it was more of a personal gain um, as much as it, again, fighting for your country and serving for your country. I actually, would received an Army Commendation Medal in red for conscientious, uh, being conscientious, doing my, uh, supporting the mission and everything, because there was a struggle to get recognized as a woman in a non-traditional job. So I think that was, and to show other young ladies that you can do this. It's hard, we're not saying it's easy, but you can do this. Well, the main thing is it's, you did your duty and, and that was it. No. I think they say that for every combat soldier, there's 10 people behind him, if I'm not mistaken. Everyone should spend some time in the service or some operation thereof. Uh, it's, you learn discipline and more important, you learn self-discipline. And it, it, it's helped me through life. The best contribution I made was hopefully molding young officers to be future leaders. Leading by example, uh, setting the tone, showing them that you don't have to uh, boss people around, you don't have to belittle people. Uh, in the service, you know my job, yeah. but you're told, you do the best job you can. Good as you can. Right. It was good for life after that. Yeah. Um, 
I wanted to uh, honor my parents' sacrifice because they were part of the greatest generation. My dad was a POW mm -hmm. and he survived all that, you know? So mm -hmm. it was uh, kind of a tribute to them. Mm -hmm. I had a debt to them that I wanted to fulfill. And uh, I would hope that somebody younger than I would fulfill a debt that I, I served as well. I learned to my so many, so many amazing methods, so amazing methods of being able to kill my bullets. They had to be found by the regiments. Beside the person going in the terrible state. Dedication to mission, that you're going to hit bumps along the road and it's going to take a while. Uh, respect for authority and that, that you don't always get to choose the course. But, mm -hmm. you know, there is, even in civilian life, there is a chain of command. And I think that was, I learned that. You're, you're taking people that, are, that barely have a high school degree and uh, versus uh, people that have postgraduate degrees. And you have everybody in between. And, and that's where the leadership component comes in. It's different than management. You can manage from a desk, but you must lead from the front. And what that means is engendering a trust in your people that they look to you and they will, they will follow you if they know that they can trust you. That's where you have to know that everybody is really pulling their own weight, number one. And number two, uh, you, you kind of give people a break. You, 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 you can't do, do everything. You can't stop everything. You have to do what, what is important. And it was hard to transition. It was very difficult. We didn't have that regimented and people looking at us and seeing the short hair and being called baby killers, and it, it was hard to transition at first, yes. It took me a while to um, get used to the quiet, actually. And a couple nights, I remember that, you know, it was summer and the windows were open, and during the night, maybe an ambulance went by with a siren going. Uh, I, I just jumped out of bed because that was, that was, an alert to me because in the middle of the night when things were going bad they sounded the siren so that mean you were you had to go on alert and you had to grab your helmet your jacket and your, your gun and go and that carried over to when i went home you 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 struggle to find yourself again because you're a new you yeah. and but what happened was the soldiers that i had served with some years later kept going and deploying. I'm injured, I'm back here at the States. Uh, I'm in the reserve, or I was in the reserve, so I had my civilian career already. And um, one of my really good soldiers was killed in Afghanistan. And it shook me, it was, it was tough, because he was a young troop, great troop. Um, and it was that hit, that gear hit, and I wanted to find a way to keep serving. And that led me to do something, right? And I'll say this to a lot of folks, if you're struggling, don't just don't, don't just like think and, and, and not do anything about it. Take action and find purpose. No matter when we got together and we were all veterans, nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about it. You never told what you did or what you didn't do. Maybe once in a while you'd do it, but you would think it would be more conversation, but there was you hardly ever referred to it. Well, it was very, very easy. I went back and uh, I, had a I had my degree in forestry. So I ended up going over to uh, and uh, living in Idaho for uh, 15 years of my career. What I want the younger generation to have mm -hmm. is guts. To be gentle when it's time to be gentle to be cognizant of people's feelings, but yet try to keep in mind when it's time to stand up and be a leader, take charge, 
be the leader. There's not heard of a person or been to learn some discipline. He's been in a lot of work, a lot of people. Yep. Maybe he gets to get a little smarter with the mission. Visit every branch, learn as much as you can, but also too, think about what you want to do when you get out. I wish you weren't in New Orleans, but to be in the service, it makes you a man. Making decisions in a timely manner, owning that decision. And when you do that and you make that decision, it better be your decision. So I think it really, it really molds you to take every day seriously and know that, you know, some of the bad days or the slow days now you might look back on and those could be some of your most rewarding days in the future. Look at the opportunities there. Look at also the educational benefits mm -hmm. that you get when you come out. And for young ladies, it's a place where you get opportunities that you won't get anyplace else. The Army has a, a saying, mission first, people always. And so how true that is. Um, the mission's gotta get done, the job has to get done. But if you don't put your people first, you may not get the job done. Or if you do, it's not going to be to the standard that you need it. Having loyalty and respect not only for other people, but more importantly, sometimes for yourself. And recognizing that, I think if you do put your mind to it, you can do it. And so that's been, um, obviously, the most important thing is having loyalty, respect, sense of duty, and understanding that you have, the have, to, you have to have an abdominal spirit to continue to move forward mm -hmm. and push through life and always try to leave this world a better place in the way you found it. We need us, the veterans of all conflicts, of all stages, need to pass on this verbal history because mm -hmm. yeah. it's being lost and I cannot thank you all enough for allowing me to have this opportunity because there are so many things like the power, the, the infrastructure of, of, the, of Vietnam, the highways, the roads. A lot of people think Vietnam soldiers were all walking through rice paddies. They think yeah. we were all being shot up, blown up, and no, that, that's not how it was. Working with the mountain yards and, and working with the Hmong, the Lao, the, just the exposure, working with all of them was so tremendous and eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And now coming back and people stateside nowadays don't realize all of that. And we need yeah. to pass it on.